All right. So uh, now coming on the show, we have former U.S. men's national team and MLS midfielder Benny Failhaber. How's it going, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, excited. Yeah, of course. Thank you for doing this. Uh, what have you been up to nowadays? Where are you living? Uh, right now I'm in Kansas City, um, but life is – Life is moving fast, so uh, don't know exactly, you know, what where my next job will be or where my family will move. So, um, just keeping me on my toes, you know, the way that the world's moving nowadays with with Corona, and we're kind of mm -hmm. trying to figure out if if that's gonna be something of the past anytime soon, or if we're in it for for the long haul. But um, yeah, just excited about the the fact that there's a lot of possibilities in in retirement, and and kind of trying to keep those. Um, doors open but no opportunities yet right I'm sure they'll, they'll come um, how's retirement been yeah it's it's been good I mean I, I don't miss the the strain the physical strain of, of playing mm -hmm. um, I still watch you know soccer all the time on tv whether it be MLS is back or you know the Prem was back and, and Bundesliga um, so I, I'm always watching sports and, and soccer specifically so so that's that's nice. And there's more free time. There's more time to, to, to be with my family and my kids. Yep. Um, and also dive into a, a few other things that, you know, were more time consuming that I could, that I could pay up, be a part of. So the podcast obviously is something that yep. um, has as much as it's weird to say it's full time. It really is full time at this point with, uh, with me, Sal and Ike. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a fan of, of BSI. It's been, how long have you been doing that now? Just over a year. We started, I think, June of last year, June or July of last year. So it's been just over a year now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, y'all have had some <clears throat> uh, pretty pretty cool guests on there. I saw y'all had Landon Donovan at, at one point earlier on. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I hope you and your family are doing well. Um, let's just get it. into your career. Um, yeah, thanks again for doing this. Really excited. Um, so you were a native of Brazil and lived yeah. there for six years before you moved to the U S why did your family immigrate? So my dad's job transferred him. So mm -hmm. we, he, uh, he worked in Brazil. Uh, he got transferred to uh, New York city. We lived, uh, in, in, in a suburb in New York and in, in Scarsdale in Westchester County. And, um, that was, that was the first we, uh, we moved to the U S but um, you know, we were there for three years. His, his job kept him there for three years. After three years, he got actually transferred again from New York to Houston. Mm -hmm. And after a year in Houston, they asked him to go back to Rio, to Brazil. And at that point, um, we as a family kind of decided, look, do we want to go back to Brazil? Um, at that point, I was already, you know, 10. My sister was eight or nine. And I think we, we kind of immersed ourselves in, in the American culture and, and we thought, you know, I think we want to stay here. We don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so my dad had an offer from a, a different company that would have kept him here in the U S and so he went there and, um, we eventually moved around a little bit more, bounced around back to the East coast, then finally California. And, uh, my parents and my sister have been there ever since. So, um, yeah, we've moved around a little bit, but all because of, uh, my dad's job. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that you would have played soccer if you hadn't grown up in Brazil? I actually think I think I wouldn't have played soccer if I hadn't grown up in the U.S. Because mm -hmm. um, in Brazil, it's it's very difficult to choose to to have the choice of trying to still go at a professional career and also get your education at the same time. Right. Whereas in the U.S., you're able to do both. Yep. And so I I. I mean, my parents focused on education, you know, more than anything, uh, soccer and sports in general was something that, you know, was, was, was a hobby. It wasn't something that like, Oh, we're, we're striving to become a professional soccer player at the age of six or at the age of 10 or even at the age of 18. And so, right. um, yeah, education was everything for, for me and my family. And, um, I think if I had stayed in Brazil, I probably would have gone much more the education route, which is what happened with my dad. Um, he was, a pretty good soccer player in his own right. Um, and, and he had to kind of change or, or decide early on, you know, I, I have to get a good education and I can't really follow uh, this, this stream because it's too risky. If it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't pan out, then where are you? And so in the U S you're able to kind of do both. You can go to college you can get an education. 
you can play soccer and and if you're good enough maybe you get drafted or maybe you go you know to Europe like I ended up going to Mm -hmm. so it was um yeah it it, I think I was really benefited by being in the U.S. uh, into becoming a a professional soccer player right um who did you when you were growing up who did you look up to like was there an athlete that you really admired or wanted to be like not really um yeah not really I mean I I've there's a lot of athletes that I, I love watching. Um, but in terms of like who I wanted to be like, unless you asked me like when I was a little bit older, maybe already even a professional player. Um, then there were guys that I watched and I was like, okay, this is something that I could, you know, be like, and, and the guys that I looked at were, Iniesta was a guy that I loved. Mm. Um, who's who, by the way, I, I think he might be younger than me. I'm not even sure, but it's it's pretty (laughs) similar age. Um, but, him uh Pirlo was a guy that I loved watching um especially you know back in the day when when he was playing at at Milan and and, and in Italy on the national team um so years before he came to uh to MLS but yeah I think you know growing up really the the guy that I kind of watched a lot and kind of wanted to be like which is probably like most kids is his dad you know um he played he played soccer I went to watch him play soccer and um with his friends and his buddies and um, you know, obviously not professionally, but it was still, to me, it was everything. And I I wanted to to get to that level. And so that was really, you know, who I looked up to and, and and who kind of guided me, especially early days and and what it was like to be a a good soccer player. Mm -hmm. So now just getting into college, did you walk on to the UCL team in 2003? Was it like a preferred walk on or did you just go out there? It was a, it was, I mean, I was a walk on at UCLA and I, what the story behind it is I wasn't very highly recruited. I wasn't on any state team or ODP team, uh, you know, early days of my, of my youth. And so teams just, I mean, colleges just didn't know about me very much. And I was on a really good club team, but also we didn't have any superstars. It was just a good team that we won state cup, I think five years in a row. Um, we won nationals one time. The only other guy that probably anybody's ever heard of on that team was Johnny Bornstein. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we played together growing up and yeah, we had a good team, but nobody was really highly recruited. Johnny wasn't highly recruited either. He went to uh, Cal Poly Pomona before, you know, transferring over to UCLA. Mm-hmm. So, um, bottom line is not many, not many colleges were interested in me. Um, and the ones that were, weren't great soccer schools. And so I had good grades. I applied to several colleges. UCLA was one of them. And the only thing that I can tell you about my communication with uh, UCLA, with Tom Fitzgerald at the time, who was the coach, he had come to one, I'd send him some emails back and forth. And I'm guessing now through his eyes that he probably had his team set. And, and then there's like those like late guys that you maybe, oh, maybe this guy can fit in as, as the last man on the roster mm-hmm. kind of thing. And he, uh, he came to watch one game that I played in high school, not even club. It was high school, which, you know, obviously is a complete hit or miss, Yeah. whether it's, there's any quality on the field at the time, but it was actually one of the better games we played, um, against a local high school that had most of the players from Irvine strikers, our youth club. So it was actually a pretty good game. And, uh, after that, he sent me an email and said, look, I think you can make our team. Um, I can't guarantee you a spot. There's obviously no money, no, uh, no kind of scholarship available, but I think uh, you can make the team. If you make it into the school, I, I suggest you come here and you, you train with us in the first couple of weeks of preseason and, and I'll let you know if you can make it, but I, I, I think you could do it. And so I, you know, I, I, once I found out that I made it into UCLA and, and kind of had all my other options lined up and decided, you know, I think I'd rather go to UCLA. I want to go, I want to stay in California close enough to home, not too close, but, at a good school, I, uh, I'll try and make the team. If that doesn't work out, then, you know, so be it. I'm still at a good school, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. And so, yeah, I went there, walked on, trained with a the team. There were two other guys trialing with the team at the same time as I, as I was, mm-hmm. and um, I was the one guy that, that made the team from, from the trialist. So, um, yeah, it worked out really well for me. Yeah, um, and talking about Johnny Bornstein, so after he transferred, were you guys roommates? We were, we were, so he came my sophomore year. So my freshman Mm -hmm. year, um, he wasn't there. He was still at Cal Poly Pomona. He came my sophomore year. He was a year older. So he was a junior. I was a sophomore. We Mm -hmm. roomed, we didn't room together. We were apartment mates. We had three rooms uh, and we had five 
total roommates. So actually Johnny had his own room. So Johnny had his own room. I was with a roommate and Patrick Ayani and uh, Kyle McClung was with another roommate. So it was, uh, it was a good time. Five guys in, in the same small apartment there. In West yeah. Um, how long did you play for UCLA before you, you were called up to the U20 team? Two years. So two okay. seasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, I mean, I was, there was a really good freshman class when I came in and no one knew who the hell I was. Um, and several of the guys were on the U20s, but then Ziggy Schmidt took over for Thomas mm-hmm. Rongen at one point, and he decided to give me an opportunity. Obviously, a guy from L.A., that, went, that coach at UCLA, he kind of had heard about me, and so he gave me an opportunity, and um, one that I wasn't really expecting, but it worked out. But, yeah, it was, uh, it was after my sophomore year that I first got called in to, uh, to the under-20 camp. Right. And then talk to me about your experience at the 2005 Youth Championship in the Netherlands, because I saw you guys top your group ahead of Argentina and Germany. I mean, that yeah. team must have been pretty loaded with talent, being able to top those two teams. We did. We had a good team, but I mean, more so than talent, we just had a really good group of guys that, you know, it wasn't. It didn't matter who was playing. A lot of guys that that just wanted to you know, do well, play for the team. And, and, and we had, we were really well coached. I mean, Ziggy was there. Uh, Peter Vermees was there. John Harks was there. Mike Lapper was there. Um, our, I mean, our, our group was really well coached and um, Mm -hmm. it was a fun tournament. And so against Argentina uh, you know, we beat Argentina. Messi comes in at halftime because that was like his (laughs) MO at the time. Uh And, and, you know, somehow we, we managed to keep it at one zero and beat Messi. And after that, I'm pretty sure we pissed him off enough where he started every game after that was the MVP <laughs> of the tournament and never lost another game. So we, uh, we were the one team to beat Messi in the under twenties, but yeah, we had a good team. We topped the group. We tied Germany. We, we, sh- we should have beat them. We outplayed them and then we beat Egypt, but unfortunately we got matched up against Italy and uh, you know, probably should have won as well, but we didn't play a good second half. We we're up. One zero at halftime ended up losing three one, um, and that was that. But it was a it was a really really good experience for me, and 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 our team was was a lot of good guys. I mean, you could you can go through the list, and there's a lot of you know pros and ex pros that that came from there. Yeah, um, and I saw some highlights of did Johnny Bornstein guard Messi in that second half, and I saw he he did pretty well. I think. No, uh, that was in Copa America. That okay, was a few years after, yeah. Got it. Um, well, then later in 2005, you played in the Maccabiah Games in Israel. What was that like? Yeah, the, I mean, it was it was crazy because after the Under-20 World Cup, I, uh, I had some offers to turn pro in Europe, but I had told, you know, the, uh, the U.S. national team for the Maccabee Games that I, uh, I was going to play. I, I, I'd already made that commitment. And so I'm going up to Hamburg and telling him, look, I'd love to become a professional player, but at first I got to play in these Maccabee games uh, because I already am committed to it. And and they think I'm crazy. You know, you're going to turn down the the amount of money that we're offering you to play in an amateur competition, potentially get hurt and all this kind of stuff. But, but yeah, it was part of, you know, it's part of who I am. You know, I made the commitment. I wanted to, to make sure that I honored it. And so it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Me and Johnny both played in that. We had a really good team um, and it was a lot of fun to kind of go with, you know, the, the, the Jewish, um, uh, uh, team, the soccer, the Jewish soccer team, really the Jewish U S team, because it's all sports, uh, yep. it's like an Olympics of sorts. And so, um, it was a lot of fun to kind of be there with all, all, all our group and, and kind of find out about Israel and kind of, um, you know, know the history and, 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 and be able to visit certain places, which is something that as a professional soccer player, even though you travel everywhere, you usually don't get to, you know, see many of the sites so right. to kind of get to know Israel in that sense was, was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Well, so you signed Hamburg tried to sign you before that tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then you, afterwards you signed with them and ended up playing with them. Yeah. Got it. Um, so you started off playing for the reserve team, made nearly 50 appearances for them in two seasons before debuting for the first team. Did you enjoy playing in Germany? I mean, what challenges did you face moving again, you know, Brazil to the U.S. to Germany? Yeah, it was, um, it was tough. At first it was – I didn't know the language. The first six months were, were rough, you know, and uh, I was only playing on the second team. I wasn't able to play on the first team yet because of uh, certain passport issues and uh, also the 
the they had changed the rule the year after from a certain number of uh, international players to you know kind of more open uh, mm -hmm. uh, rule where where you could have more international players. So I wasn't right. able to play on on the first team the first year and. It was tough. It was it was a it was a tough time. I was trying to learn German. I didn't have you know I was far away from the family. I didn't have friends and family close by, and so um, it wasn't easy. But the second year was a lot of fun. I mean, I I learned the language. I'd made good friends on the team. I started playing on the first team, played Champions League, Bundesliga, and um, yeah, it, it kind of it kind of you know made it made sense to me now why I was there you know in the first year it was like why am I here I'm not even playing you know for the first team I, I don't know the language I don't know anything and then the second year everything kind of culminated in, in, in you know what it was to, to be a professional soccer player for me and so it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun that second year in Germany. What would you say were your strengths as a player like can you talk to me about what you brought to the team? Yeah I just think I you know I've always been Composed on the ball, a guy that, you know, likes the ball at his feet, likes to make plays. Um, I, I'm always looking for the pass that creates a chance on goal. And so, you know, that's that's what I was best at. That's, you know, what teams looked at me for and uh, and what I, I tried to offer. And then, you know, some of the things that maybe weren't my strengths were, were things that I continuously tried to work on to try and improve, which, um, you know, especially in sporting Kansas City, were things that, that, that Peter helped me with to, to kind of, achieve, uh, to kind of attain and, mm -hmm. and, and, and in, and in turn helped my strengths become that much more of a strength because um, if you don't have like both sides of it, it makes it hard for you to be as um, effective throughout 90 minutes. It, it's almost like as if, you know, if the ball finds you at the right place at the right time, then you can be effective. But with the other tools, then you're, you're able to be effective for, you know, longer periods of time and, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's basically what I brought to teams, though, like right. that, that, that final ball, that vision, um, you know, the, the creative pass. And, and that's what I always felt like I've been best at. Mm -hmm. So your first call up to the senior U.S. team was in 2005 for a friendly against Scotland, followed by another call up in 2006 for a friendly against Germany. Do you remember where you were when you got that call in 2005? Actually, no, but I, I actually saw a video <laughs> recently about me talking about it. And I guess I was in Germany and um, my dad was the one that got the initial call and he called me hmm. and said, hey, uh, the national team is asking you to come in. And, and I, I mean, I was shocked. I, I, it didn't, it wasn't something that was on my radar where like, right. well, I'm only, I'm playing with the second team right now. Why would the full national team call me? But, um, you know, it was, it was pretty exciting, pretty special. Uh, and unfortunately in those first two games, I didn't get a chance to play, but right. it wasn't long after when, when Bob took over in, in 2007 that, you know, I was able to get a chance and, um, you know, I think those experiences benefited me. Mm -hmm. So you made 12 total appearances in the Bundesliga during the 06, 07 season and clearly played well enough to impress Bob Bradley because you were called up to the national team once again in 2007 making your first start against Ecuador and then scoring your first goal against China. Nice little lofted finish over the goalie. What was that moment like for you? Can you take, take me through that goal? Yeah, the China game was, was, was a lot of fun. There was a lot of guys, my age group in, in, in that game. I mean, one of my really good buddies, Sasha Kleshin assisted me on that goal. Um, I think Charlie Davies was there. Was he not? I can't remember. I think Charlie was there. I know Lee Wynn was there. Michael Bradley mm -hmm. was there. There was, I mean, a lot of young guys. There were obviously the the older guys too. Uh, you know, Clint was there, Demarcus Beasley. Um, I'm trying to remember, was Landon there? No, I can't even remember. I think he was, but maybe not. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyways, there were a lot of, of of guys that that were kind of in my age group and and guys that had been fighting together to get to that next level. So it was it was a special moment to be there with those guys, and then to have Sasha assist me on my first goal is is always going to be memorable for me and. And just kind of having that little technique to just dink it over the goalie. Um, it's just, it, it was a perfect, you know, goal for me to, to, to get with the national team. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it'll always mean a lot to me. I mean, in that summer of 2007, I feel like you really started to break through in terms of playing for the national team. Because after scoring your first goal against China, you were then included in the gold, gold cup squad later that month and scored an absolute stunner against Mexico in the final. I couldn't have caught the volley any sweeter. 
was do you think that was the best goal that you scored in your career yeah it's up there I mean I think there's there's probably a couple others that you can kind of categorize similarly to that mm-hmm. one but um I I think that I think that in terms of the moment the you know it's a final against you know your your bitter rival Mexico I think you'd have to put it at number one in terms of yeah. <laughs> you know, everything so it, it's right up there for sure and how much did you appreciate uh, Bob Bradley as a manager like what kind of guy is he and what are his strengths well I, I mean I love Bob you know I've I've been through a lot with Bob and um, he, he he obviously gave me the opportunity on the national team um, he gave me a chance to play in a world cup and a confederations cup gold cup and and then he brought me in, into LAFC which which was a you know a great year there with him as well and so I mean his strengths are that he's I've always said this about him. He is so much about the individual. So he tries to help every single person become a better player, a better person as well, but a better player to, and then in turn, help the team become a better team where a lot of coaches, I think, see the team as this big unit and it's what can the individual do for the team as opposed to let me try and work on the individual and make him as best as I possibly can. And that'll in turn, you know, help the team succeed. And so that's what Bob's been so good at. He's so, you know, meticulous in, in making sure that he gets his point across to every single individual on the team. And, and, and that's what I've always loved about him and appreciated about him. Mm -hmm. And thinking about managers that you played for in your career, who would you consider the best manager and what made them so good and what did they do differently than other managers you had? I mean, Bob and and Peter are the top two managers and that, that I've had in my career. And that's, that's, that's really you know, them and then whoever's third is, is, is quite a ways away. And look, I had, I mean, like the time with that I had with Ziggy at the twenties was really special, but I only was coached by Ziggy for one tournament, you know? And so it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, put any kind of comparison to a guy like Bob that I had for four years on the national team, one year at LAFC and Peter, who I had for a little stint with the U twenties as an assistant coach, but then for, you know, five plus years here in, in sporting Kansas city. So, I mean, those guys help, shape me who I became yep. like I said not only as a player um, but as a person and so th- those two guys are, are right at the top of my list and it's it's almost hard to differentiate them between you know 1a and 1b but it, they're they're both guys that have different different qualities um, different strengths and and for me there were there were massive in, in, in getting to getting me to, to where I, I got to in my career right and do you think your performance for the U S in, in 2007, really that summer was a big reason why Derby signed you in August of that year. Yeah, no doubt. I think the, I think the gold cup was, was massive. I was playing with the, with the national team. I, and, and I played in Copa America as well. So I played, I think close to 10 games uh, with the national team uh, at that point, just in that year. And, and so I had scored that goal. Um, you know, Darby was just coming up from the fir- from from the championship to the mm-hmm. prem, and and they they looked at a guy that had played some year, some games in Bundesliga, some games with the national team, and 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 wanted to bring me in. And so I, th- I think that had a lot to do with it, definitely. Unfortunately, Derby didn't do uh, too well during that season. Um, <laughs> no, win- <laughs> winning only one game. Um, I mean, what happened? Was it, was it coaching, lack of money, lack of talent? I mean, all those things? Yeah, a little bit of everything. I think uh, we definitely lack talent. There's no doubt about that. Uh, some of the players that were on that team were guys that I wouldn't, you know, put on my college team, you know, and oh my God, it just, it, it wouldn't, it, it just, it didn't make sense. And I think, I think the Prem is a little bit of a different animal that than, than many other leagues in the world. And, and sometimes you want guys that aren't necessarily great, you know, football players, but maybe you just have the strengths to, you know, defend or, or head a ball or hold up a, a, a player. And so mm-hmm. there are guys on that team that just that did not have football technique, but were just, you know, athletes that potentially worked well in the championship and maybe hopefully could work, some, you know, in the prem, but it just didn't pan out. Uh, Coaching for sure wasn't a strength of ours either. Um, we, we didn't have great. We had two coaches. We had Billy Davies and, and Paul Jewell, both of which um, didn't help us succeed in any mm-hmm. way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, lack of money, I'm sure that was a, a 
problem as well in terms yeah. of getting you know really good talent. But at the, at the bottom line, in in terms of how poorly we did, I think if we had had you know better coaching, put the right players even from the players that we had, put the right players on the field with the right system and, and kind of have more of an identity. I think we could have done better. We probably still would have relegated though. Um, we just didn't have the talent. We just didn't have enough talent on that team to stay right. in the prem. I mean, what was it like playing in the premier league, especially during that season, because there were some really good players at the peak of their game during that time. Like, was there one guy, one player who you, who you guys played against that, that stood out from that season? I mean, I always liked Cesc Fabregas, and he played he played mm-hmm. at Arsenal at the time, and, and they had they, they crushed us both times. I think we lost 5-0 <laughs> at Emirates and 6-2 at home. Oh, no. And um, he played really well, but, I mean, Adebayor scored. I don't know how many goals he scored in those two games, but those two guys were on a different level, and it was exciting to watch them play. And so Cesc is always a guy that, you know, I've liked watching. He has some similarities to, to the way I play, and so it was, it was fun to watch him play that mm-hmm. season. And I saw you were linked with Maccabee Tel Aviv uh, as well as the New England Revolution before you left Derby, but neither move was completed. Why did those deals fall through? Uh, there was nothing with New England. So New England – Oh, okay. New England just happened when I went, but uh, Maccabi there was. And honestly, I, I can't even tell you why the deal broke, broke down because I don't – you know, it was, it was the conversation between the two teams. My guess is just, um, you know, Maccabi asked me to come visit and Mm -hmm. Darby said, okay, but I think that they had agreed to what the transfer fee would be. And then Maccabi said to Darby, well, no, what we agreed was this. And Darby said, no, it was that. So I think there was just some kind of disagreement in terms of what the transfer fee would be. And Darby asked me, okay, come back because it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And that's all I kind of know about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you then signed for Danish side uh, AGF, and how did you feel about signing for them? Like, did you have your sights set on a certain league or team? No. So, I mean, at that point, I had just uh, I'd, I'd been through, uh, you know, a terrible year at Derby, and I just wanted out. Like, the situation wasn't good. They wanted me to leave. I wanted to leave. They were down to the championship, and um. I just played in the Olympics. And so I yeah. thought, okay, let me, let me try and springboard this into going somewhere where the only thing I wanted to do was play, you know, because at Hamburg, it was kind of up and down Derby. I didn't play much and I just wanted to go somewhere where I was going to play and do well. And so, uh, you know, Aarhus was a great place to go. They're, you know, a great city, a great team and in, in a, in a league that for me, I thought I could really develop. in, and so it was, uh, it, it was, it was something that was perfect for me at the time. Right. And in in talking about just your development there, did you feel like you grew a lot as a player while you played in in Denmark? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest issue was, you know, playing time just to get games week in, week out. And uh, the beginning of my, my Danish adventure was a little bit tough just because I got injured for about, you know, close to six months. And I I basically missed the, the, the start of the 2008 season. Um, but once I got back 2000 in February, or January, 2009, started playing and, uh, you know, put together some, some good years there, albeit, uh, the last six months we had, we had relegated from, from the, from the super Liga. Yep. So it was, it was a bit disappointing to play in, in the first division there. Um, but yeah, it was a team that, you know, that really gave me an opportunity. I feel, I felt like I grew, um, you know, during that time I was, I was playing with the national team as well and, and, right. and playing well with the national team in, in 2009 and 2010. And so definitely it was, it was a great move for me to go to, to Denmark and play and, um, and kind of get those reps that I think are so necessary for players mm-hmm. to continue to develop. Well, after that, that first season in Denmark, you played for the U S in the 2009 Confederations cup where you guys came out of nowhere, almost won the whole thing thought you you should have um but arguably the biggest win in u.s soccer was beating that spain team 2-0 in the semifinal i I mean no one thought the u.s had any sort of a chance i mean talk to me about that game and how much that win meant to you meant to you how did you guys manage to do that yeah i mean it was it was a special time because i think things kind of came together especially in that game against egypt the game before Mm -hmm. about what kind of team we could be 
And, and so we had done some good things in the first couple games. Uh, well, I guess the, the second game we didn't play very well, but the, we played against Italy. We, we had done some good things and we played Brazil, didn't play well. And we knew our, I mean, we were, our, our chances of going through was almost zero. We had to, I think, win 3-0. Brazil needed to beat Italy 3-0 as well. And obviously that's exactly what happened. But during that game against Egypt, we just, we felt like we played the way we were always meant to play. You know, and, and, and the way we created chances, the way we defended as a team, the way we made it hard for the other team to create stuff. And so mm -hmm. we played really well. And we went into the Spain game, obviously with house money at that point and, and with nothing to lose. But we, we felt good about what we had done the game before and how we matched up against that team against uh, in Spain. And so, um, you know, nobody gave us a chance. And, you know, it's like the, the cliche says, but we, we definitely felt we felt good going into that game and yep. we didn't care, you know, what, what people thought of us. And um, I remember, you know, my roommate at the time was, uh, I think it was Sasha. Maybe it was Johnny, but I think, I think it was Sasha. But anyways, mm -hmm. um, he came up to me. He's like, I think we're going to win today. <laughs> and, and I was like, I, I mean, maybe, I mean, who knows, right? Like we're, I mean, we're playing the best team in the world. Literally, <laughs> yeah. I think they had won 35 games in a row or not yeah, lost 35 games in a row. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the game starts out and I was on the bench and you start seeing like, I mean, we, we're looking good. We're defending well. They're not creating chances. We, we've got some chances to kind of go on, on the counter or build up. And that first goal, I mean, you look at it, it's a great buildup, you know, from, from start to finish. Uh, we go up one nothing, and then that's exactly what we needed, right, to be able to play with the lead. Um, I come in in the second half, uh, you know, off of that ball that Michael Bradley – Mm -hmm. uh, is able to win off of, I think it was off of Xavi, um, where he toe pokes it away from him. I'm able to kind of create something, landing crosses and Clint sniffing there on the back door to make it two nothing. At that point, I think we all knew we're going to, we're going to get this done. There's no <laughs> way Spain's coming back. Yeah. Like we're, we're just, we're just playing smarter than them. We're playing more resilient. Um, we were in that mode where we're going to defend for our lives. We're going to create opportunities and we're going to, you know, put them in the back of the net when we, when we're, when, when we have the opportunity. And so, right. Yeah, it was a fantastic game, and and I'll tell you the truth. After that game, we we thought for sure we were going to beat Brazil, and and we should have. We should have beat Brazil. We outplayed them in the first half. Arguably one of the best halves I think I've ever been a part of with the national team. That first half against really? Brazil, where we just dominated them. We we were just the better team. We deserved a two nothing lead, and I think if it's not for you know one or two unlucky bounces early on in the second half, we probably finished that game off too. So. It was a uh, it was a great run that Confederations Cup and obviously gave us a lot of uh, a lot of confidence going into the World Cup a year later. Right, that's literally what I I had written down. Um, how it must have given you guys so much confidence th that next summer. And speaking of that World Cup, um, to this day, my favorite World Cup uh, of all time, favorite U.S. national team squad. I mean, in South Africa, the theme song, the the Vuvuzelas, were those things annoying at all? Or did you just yeah. kind of tune them out? No, they were annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I feel like that U.S. national team squad and that, and that 2010, 2010 team in particular um, really just encompassed what it means to be American. You know, Bob Bradley said that that team was built around a never-die attitude. I mean, every game, apart from the Algeria game, you guys had to fight back and respond after getting knocked down. Um, the camaraderie and chemistry between the guys was stunning. And you guys produced one of the greatest sporting moments in American history. What, what do you think made that team so special? I mean, I think it's exactly what you said with, with what Bob said. And so we had an attitude where it didn't matter, you know, who's getting the glory, who's getting the plaudits and, and who's getting the goals. And um, we just cared about, competing from beginning to end and, and, and doing, you know, our country and our team um, proud. And so I think that's, that's what we had. We, we definitely weren't the most talented team that's ever right. had, you know, ever been on, at, at the world cup level for the U S but we were a team that there, there weren't many guys, uh, there weren't any guys that, you know, were looking at themselves and like, Oh, how can I, how can I do well today? And, and, you know, the only thing that everybody cared about was, was winning the game. And, and so I, I think, you know, even metaphorically speaking, that goal was just a symbol of that, you know, the way we celebrated as a team and literally everybody from the back line, you know, Jay Demerit sprinting 90 <laughs> yeah. yards to get into the dog pile. I mean, the whole bench is over there. There's half our coaches are, are, are over there as well. And so we were just a really tight unit 
And, um, and, and I think that's, that's massive, especially in international competitions where it's hard to kind of develop that with, uh, with the national team. Mm -hmm. And just on the topic of, of team chemistry is chemistry, the result of winning or is winning the result of team chemistry? Um, I think, I think, uh, chemistry or sorry, winning is the result of team chemistry. I think yeah. winning is a thing that kind of, um, I think it kind of puts a, puts a, I don't know, uh, a, an invisible cloak in, in if, if there are issues within the team. Right. But if, if you're winning, you're not like, you're not necessarily developing chemistry just because of the fact that you're winning. But if you have real chemistry within the team, then no doubt that it influences, you know, performances and results. Mm -hmm. Well, you were on the field when Landon scored that goal against Algeria. As you can see from most of the pictures, you were right there behind him right after the ball hit the net. Um, what was that, that, that moment like for you? I mean, in terms of pure emotion, was that the most memorable moment in your career? Yeah. I always say that one and, and the gold cup goal. Those are the mm -hmm. two moments that I'll always remember um, as being, you know, the most emotional moments of my career because um yeah you're, you're you win the game you you especially in that algeria game i mean it's the last minute you're you know that your world cup lives are about to end and 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 out of out of you know the the depths you find a way to to put the ball in the back of the net and and not only win that game win the group qualify for the next round and um it was it was perfect for what that team symbolized and so um, you know, some things just seem like they're meant to be in that, and that goal, like w was definitely one of those moments. Yeah. I feel like the, the stars just kind of aligned and how the, the game before that against Slovenia, you guys were, you know, wrongfully had a goal taken away from you. Um, and you know, if you would have won that game, who knows what could have happened against Algeria? Like it, it, the ending of that game, it just happened so perfectly. If you wouldn't have tied Slovenia, you wouldn't have had to win against right. Algeria. So I think that moment just kind of, it was meant to be. Yeah. Now I'll remember that, um, that moment for the rest of my life. But what was it like playing alongside Landon Donovan? I mean, what made him such a, a special player? Well, I think he just kind of knew that he was, you know, the leader on the team. And so right. he's a guy that, that, that's always up for the challenge. Um, and, and he knows that when he's counted on that he can be, you know, he's a dependable guy. And so he, he always brought his a game. He, he's a guy that um, more so than just like his, his, his technical ability, he's just a guy that drives the game, you know? And so um, you see that even that first goal against uh, Sylvania, right. he's driving and driving and driving and trying to find someone to cross the ball to. And he's like, nah, I'm just going to rip this in the top <laughs> of the net. And so he's, he's that kind of guy. I mean, he's always going to, he's relentless and he just keeps on going. And, and he's a guy that, you know, along with a few other guys on that team that were real good leaders um, was a guy that just drove us to, to perform and, and do well. Yeah. And then I, I thought you guys could have easily beaten Ghana. I think on another day, you guys would have beaten them. Um, but if you were in charge of the U S national team right now, what would you do to improve the team? Like, are there two, three strategies that you would focus on? Um, I mean, that's so tough just because we haven't seen so many, like games in so yeah, long. Yeah, right. I think in general with, with the national team, because you don't get together as often as with the club team, you need to be very um, uh, certain of ex exactly what your, your points are that you're giving to your players. You know, um, what, you know your tactics, the way you're going to play, the, the system that you're going to play, what kind of team you're going to look like. Um, and, and I think in terms of, calling players in I think there there ought to be a, a, a little bit of better of a balance of of guys that you know are, are younger and haven't had the experience yet but are guys that can definitely you know get experience get games and become you know that that kind of next um, set of players to, to take the national team uh, you know the leadership roles but there also should be guys that have been there you know for been there before that that kind of have had that experience and that can, can kind of guide those, those younger guys to become, you know, what ultimately we all hope they, they can become. Although right now it's tough because there's been kind of like a gap between, you know, because we missed the world cup, nobody got mm -hmm. that experience. 
Um, so there's a gap between guys that you don't want to bring in guys that are too old that, that aren't going to be able to play at their, at their, you know, top level and that might not be able to play in two years time when the world cup comes along. And so right. it's a little bit of a different, um, circumstance now. So it, it'll be interesting once the games start going again, you know, what the team looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, following the world cup, you played one more season in Denmark with AGF before moving to the MLS in 2011, where you played with New England, Sporting KC, LAFC, and the Rapids. Were you excited to come back to the States and play in the MLS? Yeah, I was. Um, I, I felt like I had um, – well, let me go back. I thought after the World Cup and we were in the, you know, the, the second tier in Denmark, I, I really wanted to stay in Europe and, and try and find somewhere right. to play. Um, but it was – it was really tough to find, um, you know, a good contract at the time. There was the the dip in the economy in 2008, and by 2010, it still hadn't re fully recovered. So the salaries that were being offered weren't weren't better than where I was at in, in Denmark, and so it, it made it hard to kind of find a team to go to and maybe make the jump back to Bundesliga and try my luck there again and that kind of thing. And so um, at, at around that time, MLS came, you know, talking to me about coming back and, and it was it was a good contract it was something I was excited about I knew that I was going to come back to to the U.S. to play at some point and so I thought okay well let's do this it's let's make this happen and I was excited about it mm -hmm. well in terms of you know silverware most of your success in the MLS came while playing in KC with Sporting KC you won the MLS Cup in your first season in 2013 then in 2015, you were an MVP finalist after scoring 10 goals and having 15 assists, which earned you a spot in the MLS All-Star team and MLS Best 11. And then you capped it off by winning the U.S. Open Cup. Would you say that you were at your peak of your career uh, while you were playing at Sporting KC, particularly in that 2015 season? Yeah, no doubt. Um, best five years of my career, for sure, were, were with Sporting Kansas City. Mm -hmm. and, and 2015 was a special year for me. I I, t I tell this to people, I'm like, it was almost an out-of-body experience where if I watch myself play, you know, a, a recorded game from 2015, I would say, well, that doesn't even look like me. How, how was I able to do those kind of things? I've, I'd never been like, you know, a prolific goal scorer. So, so scoring, I think in all competition, I scored 12 goals that year and, and had 20 assists. I mean, those kind of stats like were, were not associated with me. You know, I was, I was, I was always a guy that, um, you know, could, could create something, but not necessarily like have that kind of stat sheet. And so, um, yeah, everything just, just seemed to work, you know, the way you would hope for and like a yeah. dream that year. Um, and the confidence just, you know, went through the roof. And so it was, uh, it was a really fun year to play, but I mean, that was all built up through the work and, and the, and, and the help that I got with, for my teammates and, and my coaches here at Sporting Kansas City to, to kind of get to that level that year. Mm -hmm. And despite how well you played that season, uh, Jurgen, Klinsmann, Jurgen Klinsmann didn't call you up to the national team. I mean, I don't, I don't know what more um, he wanted you to do. What, what, what was the story behind that? I mean, that's, I think that's really strange that you didn't get called up that year. I mean, I don't know, you know, the story behind why he didn't call me up, but, but I, I just, and my, my guess is that he just didn't think I was a good enough player to, to be called in. So he called me in, in 2012, 2013 and 2014, all January camps. Um, and you know, he never called me in anything other than those camps and those mm -hmm. camps are so tough because they're, they're a preseason camp, right? So not everybody is, is fully fit. Um, I, for one is, I'm a guy that, that has a hard time, you know, getting fit without training. So as much as I'm going to go running and, and, and do things to try and get ready and, and prepared for that camp, I, I need to, you know, be training with players and playing games and doing things soccer related to really have that fitness at the level that, you know, other guys might be able to build up from just running. And so that's always been one of my weaknesses. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, January, Camps were tough. I mean, I thought I, I did well in, in, in 2012 in that camp. 2013, I did pretty well. And 2014, not so well. Um, and, and he just never gave me any other opportunities. And so it was disappointing. In 2015, I was playing at the level that I was and never got a chance. And um, something that, you know, I have to live with. But it, it's, uh, it's, it's disappointing. But, you know, you, you're not going to win them all. So it, right. it happens. Yep. 
Well, in your opinion, how does the MLS compare to other top leagues around the world? And if you were the commissioner of the MLS, would there be anything that you would do differently? Um, I think, I think MLS is, is starting to compare in terms of, you know, talent level with some of the top leagues in, in Europe. Um, you know, I, I definitely throw them in like top 10 in Europe. I, I think it's tough to say the top five with, with England, Spain, France, mm-hmm. Italy, and Germany. I think they don't, they don't, they're not up there yet, but I mean, a, a league like Denmark, um, uh, maybe Belgium or Portugal, those, those leagues I think are, are comparable to, to where MLS is at. Uh, one thing that, you know, I think you could change is, is just the, the salary structure where right. as opposed to, you know, have the cap be so low and then have, you know, all kinds of allocation money. You just kind of make it a certain cap where you can use that money, whether it be on um, international players, whether it be on American players, so that it, there's more of an even playing field right now. It's, it's tough for the American player that's not a superstar to kind of make that, you know, average amount of money because you can kind of use your allocation money to just bring someone more expensive from Europe and it doesn't hit your cap as hard as it would an American right. player. So those kind of things I think can change. And I think they will change with, with time, hopefully. And do you think at some point the MLS should add a promotion and relegation type of system? I think, I mean, that, I think for the fan, that would be great. I, I don't know how it fits into like the American mentality of like ownership groups and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like a fan, I, I would love to see that at some point. Right. Well, I mean, you had such a, an awesome career. Um, how much of your success do you attribute to hard work and talent and how much do you attribute to luck? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, I think, so I've always considered myself a, a pretty lucky person, right? So in my career, I think a lot of guys that had my talent and my heart and my work ethic um, probably didn't make it. And so um, you got to get, you got got to be given opportunity. So, I mean, I'll give you one example right off the top of my head. If Ziggy hadn't called me into the under twenties and he didn't have to, and it wouldn't have been any kind of crazy thing, him not bringing me in, I have no idea what, what I would have turned into. I mean, I wouldn't have gone to Europe maybe I, I go end up in MLS at some point, but nobody would have known me. I still would have been kind of an unknown. So um, very easily I could have not become a professional soccer player. And so um, there's just like, there's no doubt about it that luck is, is part of it. I think, um, you know, my mentality has always been to be, be as prepared as you can be um, so that if you do ever get the opportunity that you need a little bit luck to get, then you can, you can show well. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I've, I've been definitely more, more lucky than not so lucky, but of course there's, there's moments in my career where I felt like, you know, I was being a bit unlucky as well. So I, I right. I'd say probably a little bit 50, 50. Got it. Um, well, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, people in general talking about successes, but can you think of a time when you failed and how, you know, a failure or a parent failure set you up for later success? Um, well, I think, I think that one thing that I I wouldn't say was failed. I mean, I'm sure I failed, you know, many times in my career, but one thing that I remember was, was getting injured and, um, I had never been seriously injured before. And I got injured after the Olympics, actually before the Olympics. And then after the Olympics with, with kind of like, uh, something that kind of came back from the previous injury. And, um, I, I think I really started considering the things that I needed to do to make sure that that kind of stuff didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or at least I, I prevented what I could prevent and the amount of rehab that I, that I took not, not even like average seriously. It was like a next level of, of how serious I took the rehab, um, where I, I just wanted to make sure that, um, it was with my knee and I wanted to make sure my knee was going to be good for the rest of my career. And that I did things the right way so that, um, you know, the possibility of me, you know, losing my career because of an injury was in existence. And so, um, you know, that I think helped me big time. You know, I, I went through a, a, a bad uh, low of, of being injured and not being able to perform and not knowing yeah. even if I could continue my career um, to really, you know, working, extremely hard in the rehab process and, and getting back to where I wanted to get to so that I never had an issue again with my knee. And I, 
thankfully I never did. So it was, it was definitely a massive step um, in the right mentality, not only for that, but just for things in general during a, a professional soccer career. Mm-hmm. And uh, last one here, now that <clears throat> you're retired, what do you miss most about your days as a player? Was it the camaraderie with your teammates, the matches? And, you know, is there anything you don't really miss at all? I don't miss at all the running, at all. <laughs> so I, I, I am not one to love to exercise. And as much as I love the game of soccer, it's crazy how much I hate running. And so. Really? Yeah. And they almost go hand in hand. So it is kind of, you know, paradoxical, but uh, yeah, what I miss are the guys, man. I mean, I think it's what everybody says and it's true and, and, and being able to banter in the locker room and kind of have that, um, that kind of friendship with the guys that you meet um, is, is something special. And, and I hope that at some point I, you know, me being in love with the game of soccer and, and kind of getting back into it, that I'll, I'll kind of have that at some point again, but it's definitely something that I miss big time. Well, Benny, um, really thank you for taking the time to do this today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I had, I had a lot of fun. Um, thanks a lot. And I, I look forward to doing this potentially again sometime. I appreciate it. Adam. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, of course.